Actually, uh, so before I get into material, there's something off to the side that I want to. Oh, okay. <laughs> that worked out too well. Um, uh, I got an email that uh, Dr. Schroeder is moving himself into what was the Mathematics Computational Laboratory. It's like, really? And so I just had to check that out. And yeah, he really is. <laughs> <laughs> Miss McCardle. Wow, she had to show me the beginning of the. I think you know because it was, I guess, kind of a joke or whatever. Oh, it's his final place. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Yeah, but yeah, not morbid at all. <laughs> yeah. well, I guess if he had remained the rector, then he might have been, this also may have been his final listing place. It's just, it's just not a fun job. Um, okay. Well, now that I've recorded that. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. I actually want to see. Where for attendance. Okay, so no sign of the email. Hmm. Um, I don't think she'll be. Oh, not even she on. might just not be feeling as well. She said to watch it later. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Go ahead and um, Okay, so um, before anyone uh, actually submits homework, um, just some guidelines, just to annoyances that have come up in the past. Um, so, it's very easy to be set, uh, uh, uploaded from Canvas. It doesn't really matter to me if you um, upload like, individual files um, or um, because I can look at M files and um, uh, uh, PDFs uh, uh, just fine. Um, although, actually, you know what? Yeah, so for the purpose of running the code, it is easier if you like zip up all the files. Um, and just upload that to Canvas. Uh, so, because uh, what happens is, when you have all your files, when I see all your files in your assignment to Canvas, it doesn't let me like just download all. Um, I have to download them one at a time. Um, so, uh, but if, if you're going to zip everything up, uh, please don't put it in the subfolder hierarchy. Just have everything in one folder. Um, okay. Um, very important. Um, when I give a problem uh, and calls for running a MATLAB function, I always give the uh, interface or signature of a function, meaning what are the outputs, what is the name of a function, what are the inputs. Please conform to that exactly. Um, now, if it does happen with an assignment where I say, okay, write this function, and then in, the, in another problem, okay, modify a function to do this. Okay, that would be an exception. I can see giving you a different name in that case. But otherwise, it's certainly with inputs and outputs, don't mess with those. Because what I've done in some occasions is I will write a script that will run your code. And in the case where I know what the answer is supposed to be, I can compare to that. So it's kind of like auto grading. I don't do that very often, but I like having the option. So. Um, Okay, of course, in a class of six, it's not as necessary as like when you have a class of 20. Um, so, um, yeah, I put this in here because it needs to be said. Make sure I can follow what you're doing. So like, what problem is this? And do a problem in order. I have cases where people will jump around, like problem one, problem seven, problem three, problem two. Like, why? Um, yeah, uh, Okay. Um, okay, if it's something where you okay, have a MATLAB function and I ask questions about it, um, it's perfectly fine to put comments in the M file as to what the answers to the questions are. Um, you, know, you don't have to make a separate document. Um, also, yes, I am known for asking questions of multiple parts. I'm sorry, deal with it. <laughs> um, no, because. <laughs> It's a very common source of point loss. Of, uh, like, okay, you work everything right up to a certain point, and then there's something I ask about, and that part is just blown off or forgotten. So, um, so, so be mindful of that before you before you before you submit. Um, and as I grade, I will um, uh, um, put a. Uh, uh, I'll, when I report a grade in Canvas, 
I'll put a comment in so I can, okay, here's where the points were lost and what problem and, and why. So uh, be sure to uh, take a look at that. Dr. Lambert, yeah. I'm sort of for I don't know, kind of bad about that as you know sometimes, but what do you mean subfolders again? Like, oh, like I usually zip all my files. I I don't know maybe uh, what you're seeing on the other end. Um okay, like yeah, if you, if you um like for example, if you just select all the files and zip them up, then when I unpack them, there's one folder that has all the files. Okay. Well, so if so, you're doing that, you're that that's 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 fine. It's working fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, what some people do is they'll have, uh, like, I've, I've seen these extreme cases where someone will have, like, different folders per problem um, and put the, fi the files uh, for that problem in that folder. So there's a whole hierarchy. Okay. Uh, so it's, okay, it's not going to happen by accident. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, uh, but it, it doesn't happen very often either, but uh, someone thinks it's a good idea to have a folder for this whole folder for that. Or maybe one folder with their code uh -huh. and another with other documents like a PDF. Gotcha. Um, like, no. Okay. <laughs> I, I have it like a flat structure. So, yeah. Uh, well, any other questions about this? Um, now, one thing I'm going to check on the schedule. Um, but I should have done before last time. Okay, I have um, seven, or really not two, more like six pages of actual content in these notes, which is a lot. But I've also budgeted three whole class periods to cover this. So I do not need to go that far. And actually, I think I know where exactly I want to stop. So we'll see how it goes. Um, but I'll avoid the situation I had with the, the last section. Okay. Now, um, so the way that we've seen from the last section to solve AX equals B is essentially what you learn in a first linear algebra course like Math 326. There's, so to solve AX equals B, and I call it a Math 326 file, so you make the augmented matrix and then you perform row operations to reduce A to upper triangular form. Now, so far, we're assuming that it is not necessary to perform any row interchanges. That's only the row operation of subtracting a multiple of one row from another row. Or in language of the algorithm, subtracting a multiple of a multiplier times row j from row i, where the ij entry is the one you're trying to eliminate. Um, and those row operations are applied to the augmented matrix of so both a and b. So A is reduced to upper triangular form, and then B is updated accordingly, so that the system has the same solution. Then you perform back substitution on the, the upper triangular matrix U that you get out of it, which in 326 parlance is known as row echelon form. And, um, and once you do that, then you have your solution in your document. Now, um, as I mentioned last time, but I'll uh, flush that more clearly now, um, this is not really the best way to go because, um, uh, and, and meaning applying row operations at the same time to both A and B, because which row operations you perform, like which multiple of row J to subtract from row I, that is determined entirely by the entries in A. It has nothing to do with B. So, um, so, so what you should be able to do is figure out what you need to do in terms of row operations to reduce A to upper triangular form. Then store that information somehow so that if you're having to solve A to equal B again, but with a different right-hand side, same matrix, you can just repeat those row operations. So it's like you're saving a, a script, if you will. So yeah, you need some sort of record of what you've done. Um, also, gas elimination, as applied to A, that's what's incredibly expensive. Um, I, I've shown you how it turns out that uh, take two-thirds n-cubed operations 
um, to reduce a to upper triangular form in a general case, so the n by n matrix. And, um, and again, that, that has nothing to do with a B part. That's only working on A. Um, anything you do to B takes takes much less time. So you want to uh, so you want to have to do that only once. Like if you're solving AX1 equals B1 and then AX2 equals B2, that's two systems, but you want to do one Gauss elimination, save it information to use it for the second system. So how can we efficiently store information about the row operations that were applied to A so that we can readily repeat them. So what we'll do is we're going to do gas elimination, but forget about B. We're not going to work with the augmented matrix anymore. And here's an actual application where this is necessary. We're solving A equals B several times with the same matrix but different right-hand sides. Um, now, this is something that I'll get into more later uh, when we get to chapter 12 on initial value problems for ODEs. Um, that if you're trying to solve a system of ODEs like this one, um, and you use what's known as an implicit time-stepping method, such as backward Euler, and again, you'll learn about this later this semester in this class, um, that actually brings about this situation where you have uh, the, the matrix change, the matrix staying the same, and the right hand side constantly changing. So you want to just do gas elimination before you start time stepping at all, and then reuse information at each time step to solve each new system. So it's not some. So I'm not talking about some situation that's never going to come up. It really does come up. So this is what leads to what's known as the LU decomposition. But to get to that, because I need to describe what that is, we're going to think in terms of these row operations, think about these row operations in terms of matrix multiplication. It's a very helpful perspective for what we want to do. Okay, so here are the three kinds of row operations. So scaling a row, which doesn't, we don't really need very much. Interchanging rows, that will be needed from time to time. And then the most important one, subtracting a multiple of one row from another. So each one of these can be represented by an elementary row matrix, which you might have seen in a first linear algebra course, such as 326. So for example, um, because really all you have to do is take the row op operation you want to perform and apply it to the identity matrix. So here, we want to interchange rows one and three. So if we multiply our matrix A, by this matrix, where we've taken the identity and swapped rows one and three, that will do the job. Same thing here. We want to subtract, um, take row one, multiply it by two, and subtract it from row four. So if we do that to the identity matrix, then multiply that by our matrix A, that will perform the desired row operation. So, so now we know how to describe each individual row operation, but what about a sequence of elementary row, of row operations? Uh, can we describe that as easily as we can a single one? So for that, we look into what are called unit lower triangular matrices. Now, I mentioned this last time. A unit lower triangular matrix is a matrix that is lower triangular, and has all of the diagonal entries equal to one. Um, now, here's an example of a unit lower triangular matrix. This one that's meant to apply subtracting a multiple of a row from another row. Um, and it's always going to be a unit lower triangular matrix when it's Gaussian elimination. Why? Because what are you trying to do? You're trying to Subtract the multiple of row J from row I, and it is always assumed that I is greater than J. Why? Because you're trying to eliminate entries that are strictly below the main diagonal. So, so I greater than J is always going to hold. Right. 
Um, so, 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 so that's the, the, the key here. This, that's why it's called a triangle. Now, here's the very convenient properties of units, lower triangular matrices. That structure is preserved by multiplication. So if you take two unit lower triangular matrices and multiply them, the product is also unit lower triangular. I have unit in parentheses here because if I take unit out of a sentence, it's still true. So the two plain lower triangular matrices, you multiply them, it's lower triangular. So multi matrix multiplication preserves triangularity. It also preserves inversion. So if I have, because uh, one thing you mind is a unit lower triangular matrix is always going to be non-singular or invertible. Because when you have a triangular matrix, Take the determinant, you just multiply the diagonal entries. Well, if it's, if it's unit lower triangular, the diagonal entries are always one. So the determinant of one of these matrices is always one. Um, so, so the inverse of a unit lower triangular matrix um, is also unit lower triangular. So inversion and uh, multiplication preserve triangularity. Um, I, I won't get into the proof here. Um, it can be proven. It's quite tedious um, using um, the formula for, for matrix multiplication. So, suppose we are eliminating all the entries below the diagonal. Then each time you eliminate one, you're multiplying A on the left by a unit lower triangular uh, matrix. Um, and um, so now what you're doing is effectively you're multiplying A by a sequence of unit lower triangular matrices. Now the product of all of those, based on these properties, is going to be unit lower triangular. But that's a start, but we'd like to know what's happening in that lower triangle. Is there a way to easily arrive at that? So, so here's what's happening as an equation. So here's my matrix A. I multiply it by like, E21 to eliminate the 2, 1 entry. Then I multiply it by E31 to eliminate the 3, 1 entry. All the entries in the first column. Until I get to the bottom. Then I move to the second column. And I eliminate E32, 42, 52, all the way to N2. And then I keep going. Um, now, another way of writing it is as this product, where each one of these, M1, M2, and so on, works on the entries in the corresponding column. So this matrix eliminates all the subdiagonal entries from column one, here in column two, and so on, until we get to the second to last column, because there's nothing to do in the last column. Another way of putting it is, each one of these MJs is equal to a product of these elementary row matrices that carry each one of these eliminating a single um, entry below the diagonal. Any questions up to this point? I know I've thrown a lot of notation at you, and it's only going to get worse. Pages I want to try to get through. Oh, oh! I'm only, only requiring myself to get through one more page. <laughs> Might be a pretty painful page, though. So we'll see how it goes. Um, all right. Now, um, okay. So here's an example. Um, because every time we want to eliminate the IJ entry. What is the elementary row matrix? It's the identity matrix, except for minus the multiplier in the spot we want to zero out, row i, column j. So, for example, suppose this is our multiplier for the 2, 1 entry, and this is our multiplier for the 3, 1 entry, and this is our multiplier for the 4, 1 entry. So these 
multipliers serve to eliminate all the entries below the diagonal in the first column. So when we multiply these together, it's nice that there's a lot of zeros here, of zeros and ones, which suggests that maybe the product's going to have a pretty simple form. And sure enough, it does. Here's what we always get. It is a unit lower triangular matrix, and that we knew. But look at some multipliers. They just fill out that first column. So, um, so that works out really nicely. So, so the product of these elementary row matrices are unit lower triangular, just stacks and multiplies like that. So that suggests that maybe we can really have a convenient record of the row operations that are being performed to reduce A to upper triangular form. What's also helpful is now if I want to take the inverse of this, that's very easy too. It can be shown that all you have to do is here's minus multipliers. Now I'll take the negatives of both. So really it's just the multipliers um, that, that, that fill that column. Now, How that helps us is if we re-examine the, the whole gas elimination process where we work on column one, column two, and so on. Then, and then the result of all that is this upper triangular matrix U. But what I can do is I can, all of these are invertible, so I can multiply by M and the minus one inverse and so on, all the way up to M2 inverse, M1 inverse. Basically, I'm rearranging this equation, and this is what I get. So the inverses of all of these times U. In effect, I have a factorization. A is factored into the product of all of these and my final upper triangular matrix U. Now, for convenience, I'm going to define the inverse of all of these. So M1 inverse is L1, M2 inverse is L2, and so forth. Now I have all these multiplied together. Now, because every row operation is represented by a unit lower triangular matrix, all of the M's are unit lower triangular. Therefore, their inverses are unit lower triangular. Therefore, a product of all of these is, again, unit lower triangular. Everything is unit lower triangular. <laughs> um, now, we know what each of these factors look like. This. Um, so each one of these has the multipliers needed to limit the entries in column J sitting in column J. But one of these matrices only works on one column. What happens when we take all of those kind of matrices, so something like this with entries multipliers in the first column, and another one of these with multipliers in the second column, and so on, and multiplies them all together? What kind of structure does that have? Because how do you know it's not going to be something completely messed up that you can't decipher? But it turns out, oh, I haven't shown you here. Okay. Actually, I'm trying to see if I have something. I'd like to have a visual for you. I'm surprised I didn't include it here. I think when I taught this class two years ago, I was typing all this as I go, and that seemed like too much to type out. Um, but, um, okay. Ah, dang it. Hold on. Can show you. I wanted to unshare and reshare. Okay. So each one of these L's, L1, L2, and so on, 
looks like this. It's identity, except for having for the multipliers for column K stored below the diagonal in column K. Now, the question is, what happens when I multiply all of these together? Here's what it looks like. So if I define L to be the product of all of these Ls of the superscript, this is what I get. And it, honestly, it could not have worked out my, more nicely. So, so L is just a unibody triangular matrix that has all the multipliers stored in the lower triangular part. Um, so the multiplier for row two, column one is sitting in row two, column one. So, and if you find that A is a product of all of these L's times U, we've now achieved this factorization, the LU factorization, also known as the LU decomposition. So A can be written as a product of a unit lower triangular matrix L and an upper triangular matrix U. Now, what are these matrices? The Gaussian elimination process tells you. So the upper triangular matrix U is the result of Gaussian elimination. So you reduce A to upper triangular or row echelon form, that's U. Whatever multipliers you use, whatever multiples of row J to subtract from row I, you store that in the interesting part, the lower triangular part of L, and that's how you get that part of the LED composition. And there you have it. Now you have a way to repeat Gaussian elimination on A, because you have the multipliers, and you know which rows they work with because of where each multiplier is stored. So having a certain entry in row 3, column 2, tells you, OK, I'm going to take that number times row 2 and subtract it from row 3. And you can see, so, so it really is a script, uh, a transcript of the Gaussian elimination process, exactly what row operations happen. Hmm. Okay. Now, so how does that help you? Suppose you're solving AX equals B for many different right hand sides B. So you go ahead and carry out Gaussian elimination, and it will give you both the L and the U. Then, because uh, multiplying A by L inverse would give you your um, upper triangular matrix U. Similarly, if you multiply B by L inverse, that gives you the modified B from the augmented matrix for a Gaussian summation on it. So what you can do is all those row operations that are described by L, you now carry them out on B each B that comes to you. And this is only computed once. You just keep reusing um, L. Now, what you're doing is effectively solving a lower triangular system that calls for forward substitution, the algorithm I gave you last time. But to summarize, if A is decomposed into LU, that means that LUX is equal to B. So what I'll do is I'll define the vector Y to be U times X. Now, at the beginning, Y is unknown. So we know how to solve for it because if I call this Y, I know that LY is equal to B. So now I have a three-step process for solving AX equals B using the LU composition. So first you do gas elimination on A, that gives you the LU decomposition. And this is how much work it takes, two-thirds n cube floating point operations. Then you solve LY equals B. Now L is unit lower triangular, so you use forward substitution. And that requires n squared minus n plus. So this line that you saw in the Gauss elimination algorithm, that actually was carrying out this process. I just hadn't described it that way yet. Now when you have y, that means the original system x equals b is equivalent to this system, ux equals y, 
This is what you get from applying both row operations on both sides. Here you're doing it on the left side of A is equal to B. Here you're doing it on the right side. You just do them at different times. Then you solve this, and U is upper triangular, so that calls for back substitution. That takes N squared operation. And then you're done. You have your solution X. So this part, by far the most expensive. So if you're solving, but it has nothing to do with B. So if you're solving A equals B for many different Bs, you do this once, and then you carry out steps two and three that are much cheaper, only order N squared plus instead of ordering Q um, for each B that you have. <clears throat> Now, we're still assuming that it's not necessary to perform any row interchanges. Uh, that's something I will um, discuss next time. So this is an example of how matrix decomposition or matrix factorization can uh, lead to more efficient algorithms than what you might otherwise have. Um, it's been very helpful in the design of a great many algorithms, so much so that Around the year 2000, when uh, uh, leading experts in numerical analysis got together and decided to choose the top 10 algorithms of the 20th century, uh, one of the 10 was not a particular algorithm, not a specific algorithm, but rather just the whole approach of using matrix decomposition to design algorithms for numerical linear algebra. Uh, so, so, so that. Perspective by itself was named one of the top ten. Um, other algorithms that made the top ten were, uh, well, if you take the computer science classes, a quick sort, um, also the fast Fourier transform, um, the QR algorithm for computing the eigenvalues of a matrix, which I cover in Math 610, um, and oh, uh, the design of the uh, first Fortran compiler. That was the, the first compiler ever. Um, that, that, that was a huge deal. Um, and there are other ones that I guess are to me personally less interesting, so I'm not remembering them right now. But um, I actually was a teaching assistant for a class at Stanford that was all about these top 10 algorithms uh, that my advisor and a summer professor taught. And they didn't feel like talking about the Fortran compiler, so they made me do it. Um, uh, fast multifold method, that's, that's another one of the 10. Like, now I want to see if I can remember all 10, but I won't bother right now. Um, okay, so um, I'll tell you, that's how, that's how uh, I, I don't want to saturate you with anything more. Um, I think this has been uh, the one, the one day, and I still have two full class periods to get through the rest of these notes. Actually, okay, um, the next step is Distance and uniqueness. Um, because this kind of factorization, I'll get, I'll get into details later, it, it does not always exist. You can't necessarily factor any matrix this way because you might have to interchange rows. But when it does exist, it's unique. Okay. Um, now, um, well, we have plenty of time for questions of any kind. They will start any more problems. Done most of them for the first homework. I just have to check them to make sure I answered everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 um, what did I make that do? Uh, uh, is Sometimes in February, so. Uh, I think it's February 2nd. Yeah, it is. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's a time. Oh, yeah, I'm just trying to make it crack that. I don't need to start until January 31st. Not very seriously. <laughs> 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 Probably next day you have enough coding to get to now. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay, patience are really killing me. Which problems you always change your problems I guess I guess some people do that like see more illegal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If we look at the homework problems I've defined from this section, at least from the part I've covered so far. Oh, well, I must have been dastardly to assign that. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so actually proving that this works out, that um, so we have two. Now, actually, I'm perfectly fine with you choosing one, like upper, upper or lower. So like, show it upper triangular times upper triangular times upper triangular. Um, and also um, the uh, inverse of a, uh, for, for instance, upper triangular matrix also being um, upper triangular. and. Um, okay. Now, as far as this one, so this could use some preemptive hints. That's on homework two. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, this is the general formula for matrix multiplication. Um, so, for instance, if A and B are both upper triangular, you want to show that C is upper triangular. And you have to take into account that because these are upper triangular, like this entry AIK is going to be zero if I is strictly greater than K, or this will be zero if K is strictly greater than J. And so to show that it's upper triangular, you want to assume that I is strictly greater than J, uh, because you're talking about an entry in the lower triangle. And you want to show that this sum must be zero in that case. Um, so that's the general framework for how you approach that one. Um, and as for the other part of it, dealing with the inverse, um, and I, I, I do give a hint here. So. Um, if you're trying to find the inverse of, for, for example, an upper triangular matrix, then you're solving the system, let's say, um, U times a matrix X equals identity, where X is the inverse that you're looking for. And um, so to find column J of the inverse, you're solving the system U times xj is equal to ej, where ej is a j column of identity. I'm going to write that down in the notes. Um, okay. Oh, I need to put that. Yeah, I'm going to cut this out and that might be left in the next notes. Okay. Okay. So it's always, this is for ux equals i. If u x j is equal to e j, where x j is j column of the inverse, and e j Is J column of identity. Now, column of identity is all zeros except for a one in the J position. So, if you think of, um, about in terms of solving this system, if U is upper triangular, how are you going to solve it? Back substitution. You're going to start from the bottom and work your way up. But for a given column J, the entries on the right hand side at the beginning are zeros up to a certain point. 
So you can use that to show that certain entries of this column must be zero. The entries that would go in the lower triangle. Therefore, the inverse must also be lower triangular. So, so in other words, of showing that the i entry of xj must be zero. Which would show that the inverse is upper triangular. Okay. Um, oh. I gave this away sometime in class. So this was on how well you were paying attention. <laughs> um, Number nine. Oh, I did that last class. Okay. So the difficulty of first problem is made up for by accidentally giving away, or maybe intentionally giving away answers to the next two. Uh, number 10, oh, tedious. Um, but make sure you understand the Gaussian eliminated process and how it leads you to the LU decomposition. Um, refractions are not all nice. So it's one of you about the other part. Um, 11, 14, 15, 20. Oh, okay, you're taking a gas elimination from homework one, modifying it to do homework two. Please follow the directions on how to modify it so it has the proper inputs and outputs so this gets Goes to what I was saying at the beginning of class. Um, some students wouldn't do that and it's driving nuts. Like, follow directions. Um, okay, th this gets into stuff I haven't covered yet. Um, there are different approaches to pivoting, which is uh, forming row interchanges. Uh, the most popular one is partial pivoting, so you have to carry that out on this matrix. So be careful. Um, okay, and then do it again with a different pivoting scheme known as uh, complete pivoting. Um, okay, then the last one is number 20. That's the most dastardly coding problem in this assignment. Um, yeah, so you're writing a function that solves ax equals b. And really it's a combination of three functions that carry out the three main steps of solving ax equals b that I described a little while ago. First function does Gauss elimination or partial pivoting. So the most difficult part of this problem is including partial pivoting in your Gauss elimination because the previous problems that deal with Gauss elimination do not require pivoting. Um, I will post some hints about that. It's kind of a pain. Um, and then the result of Gauss elimination is passed to um, a function that carries a forward substitution, which is done earlier in the assignment. And then that result is passed to a function that does back substitution. Um, so this function actually does very little by itself. All it does is call a function for Gauss elimination, call a function for forward substitution, call a function for back substitution. So it's literally three lines long. It's in those functions where the real work is done. So you also get practice constructing an application from multiple functions that all work together. Okay, so somewhere in here I have a hints document. Um, I need to look that over because it's from two years ago. And uh, I will post that well, on, on, on this site, but also um, in Canvas, uh, where homework two is. You can find it there. Otherwise, some of these problems are a little bit evil. <clears throat> well, you might think they're still evil even with the hints, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's always evil. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's a healthy mix. 
And this is this is to um, get students out of thinking. You know, not every problem is um, excruciatingly painful. Just some of them. Because <laughs> um, I've seen students take a problem that's meant to be easy, and because they're just so accustomed to every problem uh, being a nightmare, that they make that easy problem so much harder than it needs to be. And just like that problem. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Um, those were asked for any questions. Nobody, nobody had any. Um, <laughs> but um, that will stop you from asking again. Because there's still a little bit of time, or a lot of time. Anything at all? Okay. I'm not sure how long to make an awkward silence. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll continue with LED competition. Um.